One common theme I heard through the day and in your presentations as well is the paucity of data, paucity of studies. And I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if indeed that is going to be our reality. It's not that, you know, at some point it's going to change. I'm just wondering, and you know, this notion of continuous improvement that we've just spoken about last time, shouldn't we be, in a sense, anticipating that and moving to more Bayesian approaches towards evaluating these things rather than statistical approaches? Because it seems to me this mechanical statistics needs the kind of data that we, we will not have. So I think the, uh, the biomedical model and the health model is that you need the regular kind of statistics that, and with p-values and things like that, that um, to be believed uh, for, you know, we, we push um, evidence-based medicine and that evidence-based medicine is based on the fact that there are randomized clinical trials for oxytocin use in third stage of labor, uh, for, as an example. Um, so we should use those same methods to show that our improvement methods have a good evidence base as well. So, you know, we can use different methodologies for sure, but we need to try to be as rigorous as we can be in the circumstances. One of the issues in this field is that we are working in low and middle income countries. And so there are not a lot of resources. You know, if we, in other fields of medicine, there are huge amounts of resources for, to do very rigorous, large studies. And we can't change the fact that we're working in low and middle income countries. And so there isn't the same demand, there isn't the same money to do really rigorous research, but we should, with the resources that we do have, try to make as rigorous uh, studies as we can. Nish, do you want to also respond to the question? Uh, yeah, Nachiket, I agree with you um, that yes, data is a limitation, but it is uh, that because possibly because the investment in this area has been much less than than others, and that's an area where we possibly need to do much more than what we have done before. If I if I may, just ask a follow-on question to that uh, question, because I, it strikes me that uh, earlier in the day, somebody put a slide up about every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it's getting. This is a situation in which uh, we are achieving a certain result, and the result is a paucity of data uh, generally on effectiveness of these interventions as well as on cost-effectiveness analysis. And my question, I guess, to both of you is, is there an evidentiary need from your point of view, um, and perhaps others in the room could answer this question as well, uh, for cost-effectiveness analysis with respect to quality improvement interventions. At this point in time, these interventions are being funded by donors. And the question is, uh, where's the evidentiary need, in your view, for these kinds of analyses? I would have to say yes. In uh, a lot of the research that we've done, or at least some of it, the result is that investing in quality improvement will actually save money to uh, the country over the short term, sometimes even it, sometimes it's just a few months, they will actually save more money than they spend on quality improvement if they do it. And if we can make that case in a very rigorous kind of independent way with objective data, then I think we will get those countries to implement this improvement, uh, these improvement activities, and and that's really what we want. Especially with, you know with USAID, I mean we USAID gets a certain amount of funding, and really it's you can see it as kind of seed money to push, uh, in this case, health systems to a better place. And I think if we can sh make a case of how that's happening, then I think we're uh, serving our purpose well. Uh, there's two questions here and then one in the back. Uh, let's start here with uh, Frank. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, thank you. Um, I'm interested to hear um, a little bit more about how you would recommend that we conduct implementation research or operation um, research. Both of you are advocating for it. And I think we do need more and robust data. I think it's possible to do that through operations research, but I think we need to get away from thinking that the RCT is necessarily the gold standard uh, to do that because operations research doesn't, and this type of quality improvement methodology doesn't necessarily lend itself at all to that methodology of evaluation. So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, because the practical reality is uh, that, yes, operation research is what is much more feasible and what can be adapted into most settings. Um, again, uh, uh, it's not that uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a constant effort to actually build capacity among frontline uh, frontline uh, 
health professionals to actually design simple research studies that can actually identify solutions and which they can then take on into their implementation and, uh, and then to actually study that, that to actually then move on to the next level. Again, this requires a lot of capacity building, which is again um, an area that, uh, that, uh, that needs to be much more uh, financed and much more prioritized than what it is now so that uh, this can then become a part of that process of improvement that is there. Just as an example, if we were asked by a USAID country mission to implement improvement in 100 facilities in two districts, then maybe we could ask if we could uh, implement the improvement activities in two phases and we could randomize those and have a step wedge design. And we have done that in some places. Sure, it's not the best design, but quite often they are the ones who uh, choose the circumstances, you know, sometimes they don't give us very much time, sometimes they, we, we have limited funding, etc. but we have to work within those constraints to make the best design possible, and that's just one example of the way that we should do it. We should always be thinking what is the best that we can do with the resources that we have to make a study that will be believed by those who are outside the field of improvement and who don't know what we do and who don't believe in it. Um, that's the audience that we have to show to whom we have to show it works, or otherwise, because we can also learn from bad results too. Pierre. Uh, yeah, this is more of a comment. Um, I mean, it strikes me that we are struggling um, after the fact to, to try to collect the data that we need uh, to tell the story. And I think this goes back to the, the underlying uh, sort of premise of the meeting, which is really to better define and describe uh, the uh, methods by which we want uh, to do our work and to undertake um, a very strong uh, designs, uh, rigorous designs as we're setting off um, to make sure that we have the uh, information to tell the story um, by the time we get to the end uh, of, of whatever it is that we're doing. I, I, I think that there is, this is a, a, a very uh, important opportunity for us for the future is, is to be very uh, deliberate about um, how we go about uh, designing uh, our work uh, with a very clear uh, theory of change, um, very uh, uh, clear aims and, and, and measurement strategies, and to build dissemination um, and, and uh, evaluation plans into everything that we do. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in, in two, three years' time, we're not going to have this problem. But I think it's hard to retrofit um, uh, all of the data that's out there in a very disorganized um, uh, uh, pattern into, into something intelligible. Thank you, Pierre. There's a question in the back of the room. Thank you, um, John Peabody. We, uh, we have the task of trying to put together DCP3, a synthesis around what's happening in quality. And I, I'm wondering, uh, I have a question for the three of you. Um, not that long ago, um, in this room, there was an IOM committee on one of the most extraordinary things to happen in medicine, which is the declining mortality rate in cardiovascular disease. Um, pretty extraordinary story about how people aren't dying from this disease in developed countries. Could we extend that to developing countries? One of the levers that you know, we discussed in that meeting was how powerful cost-effectiveness research had been in sort of changing everybody's thinking about it. It was powerful in the sense that it showed the value of prevention. It was powerful and it showed that complications occurred. It was powerful and it showed that you didn't need to be admitted to the ICU just because you had chest pain. Um, as we struggle with this data question today, there, it seems to me there are other issue, issues that we were talking about. Um, I was talking with Jishnu about this uh, earlier. Uh, we know poor quality in medicine is particularly powerful incentive because you harm people. There are complications, legs get removed that shouldn't, um, appendicitis is missed. Um, uh, is there a way that we can use cost effectiveness around something that's a little bit easier to define, adverse events, complications, uh, uh, untoward deaths, as, to, as a way to start to lever the benefit of higher quality? 
Yes, absolutely. And in some of the cases we have done that, for example, in one of the studies in Nicaragua was looking at uh, rates of ventilator-associated pneumonia among neonatal patients. And we showed that, you know, with a fairly small, modest investment, um, a significant amount of money was saved and the, the rates of VAP was substantially decreased in, in that setting anyway. Um, so, yeah, we definitely want to do that. And we, it, it's great to have um, data that we can rely on that we don't actually have to collect as, uh, as a primary source. And th the problem is, though, that in many of the settings in which we work, the data quality are very poor. And so we're very con uh, cognizant of the fact that we really have to look at the validity of the data that we collect if we're not getting it ourselves. And a lot of the uh, adverse events data is of dubious quality in a lot of the settings that we found. Thank you. Dinesh, do you want yeah. to also respond? And no, I, I agree um, that looking at adverse events and um, the uh, looking at the harm that 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 uh, that uh, poor quality of care pr uh, produces could be a way of uh, more, uh, an equally powerful way of actually conveying the the information that we would want to do in terms of the actual cost effectiveness of the intervention. Great, Edgar. Yeah, very briefly is just. Probably we, what we need to define is how much we want to, to assess and what we want to assess because we may, may end up uh, finding that this is highly, a highly contextual, uh, complex intervention and what we find in, with a very strong design in one place is not valid in, in other places. For an example, I saw this study of the Dr. Provost men mentioned here, the checklist was a very strong study in Michigan, but then uh, in other places it may not work. So is a compelling case in one place, but so that's why the limits will have to be defined and the costs, because everything cost, uh, has a cost. Thank you for that comment. Any responses from the panel? Yeah, it's, it, and that goes for all of the interventions. It's about uh, how effectively you implement. That's where we see is the biggest challenge of today is, uh, like even supervision and training, a poorly implemented supervision or a poorly Im implemented training does much more harm or is even uh, it creates much more waste than 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 any anything else. So it, it, it's it's how do you focus down on a few key things and just drill it down again and again is what what will give us those results. And I, I absolutely agree with, with that issue that a lot of it is context specific. But my philosophy on this is do the study, note the limitations, put it out there, and then people reading it can say, well, you know, our local context is much different to this, so I'm not going to pay much attention to this study. Or they can say, well, my context is really quite similar to that, so let's try it. You know, as long as it's out there and as long as we're open and transparent about the limitations of the studies, it's fine. And, and because that's, you know, the, this kind of thing with the social context, et cetera, it's totally true, but it, it's true for every part of every complex social intervention. And there are a lot of them out there outside this realm. Three questions that will close us down. I think Don, then Jishnu, and then Mike. Don. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask Nick a question in light of this uh, Panel. So, Nick, you, if I heard you correctly, you were describing in the OECD studies a pretty large-scale shift in many countries toward embedding various approaches to assurance or improvement um, n now. Um, my question is, is it, is it your impression that's being driven by evidence that they're doing it because something has convinced them to do it? And in particular, do they see it as a way to contain costs? What, what, why, why are they doing that? Well, that's <clears throat> difficult to answer in general. What I say, the, the overall shift from, from cost control as the main governance mechanisms to outcomes, basically because there is a realization that, that yes, you should try to tackle value, and there have been numerous OECD reports and debates in the past five, six years where policymakers and ministers of health have been discussing the value of the, the creation of value in the healthcare system, 
uh, several reports try to capture uh, efficiency in different ways with different e ways of economic thinking. And the latest is to, to concentrate on, on the waste. But all our attempts to, to try to conceptualize the performance of the healthcare system. And within that, yes, you, you, you then get a debate, are we spending, because that's part of the answer, are we spending it on the right things? And the crisis in 2008, which, which meant for a huge amount of countries a, a decrease in, the, in, in the, the continuous increase in, in cost, has put that pressure on it even, uh, even more. So in short, what is the driver? It's the overall realization that outcomes are important. And it's also the realization that a system that is only governing on costs of the components gets stuck. So we, we have a debate, for example, now on, on reinvesting in prevention. There's been a whole series of studies on the economics of prevention, basically advising countries on, on what is a sensible policies to do with respect to uh, obesitas, the <clears throat> fit not fat studies. We are now having those debates on alcohol. But that's there's a big economic focus there too. And the other is on, on what is the relative cost effectiveness of the system as a whole. But then you take a societal perspective and you get a lot of boundary debates of what costs are in, what costs are out. But that's the kind of information that the policymakers want to have. So the, the whole shift from just spending on the hospital sector to primary care is, is linked to that. And that was linked to my observation, yes, to to show the effectiveness of the primary care system, we, we now get stuck because the information structure is not there. So a, a long answer, but you see there's a different way of thinking about performance of health systems and seeing it not just as a cost control issue, but a lot of different approaches with economic thinking on operationalizing value, efficiency, cost effectiveness, and waste. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Jishnu. Just a quick question. I mean, puzzled about the contradiction between, you know, from the morning we've been hearing these QI efforts work only if there's data, right, and continuous measurement, and then there is no data, right? Uh, so really, I guess what you mean is for research, you need the data from a comparator group, and those data are missing, or when the effort is over, there's no data after that, which probably means the QI is gone as well because there's no data, right? So I was just wondering, you know, where there has been a lot of success on the data front is the DHS, which is a USAID funded effort. And, you know, we've had enormous success in teasing out range, a range of variation in those data, linking it to, um, you know, different health interventions ranging from the building of roads and their impact on health to institutional deliveries and their impact on health. And what's really been important is there have been contested groups who come up with many different estimates based on the same data and eventually some consensus develops, right? I mean, so for example, in India, there's been a huge fight going on about whether institutional deliveries decreased mortality and there are seven different estimates out there and we're converging to some kind of idea that it didn't. Now what I'm puzzled about a lot of this is I haven't seen any public data on these things, right? I mean, I haven't seen the public data that says, here are the public data you guys can all go to and crowd in, you know, 80 researchers uh, who can work on that and come up with multiple estimates on, on what's going on. So I'd like your impression on, you know, is it, is really, for me, you know, at the World Bank, one of the things we think about is what's the global public good? And it seems to me the global public good here is really providing the data and then just providing your geolocated projects. And there are 70 different ways we can evaluate it after that. Uh, thank you for that comment. Are there any reactions from the panel? Uh, so we do that. We uh, collect the data and we will publish it uh, where we can or we'll put it up on our website. I, I'm, uh, I can't, I can only speak for the ESS project and the work that we do, uh, not the others. Um, in terms of triangulating or using DHS data, yes, that is something that we have discussed and it's something that we want to do. Quite often we are asked only to work in a fairly small geographic area within 
the larger context of oh, what's happening in the country and sometimes the DHS data is not that finely grained, which is a bit of an issue, but it is something certainly that we should look at. I mean, if we're saying, hey, we've been working in this country for X number of years on maternal and neonatal health and it's spread all around the country, then we should be able to go to the DHS and show that we can see a decrease. We won't have a control group, but I mean, we can, and we won't be able to claim that it's all of all our work, but we should be able to see that to confirm at least those issues, but that's a good point. Thank you. Just to add to that, uh, I think, Jishnu, what we also like, I, I feel is more the link between the interventions and the uh, and the data, the, the quality intervention data that goes with that. And I think that that is the area that that is that is lacking. While we have more generalizable coverage data and uh, from the DHS, but uh, when when it comes to really linking it up with the intervention, there's a paucity of that data. Okay, the final question to Mike, and then we'll close down. Uh, thanks. It's just really part technical, and then I'd like to come back on the DHS. Um, as somebody who's tried to struggle with doing a CEA on a, a kind of quality improvement intervention, one of the, the key problems is the link between your quality metric and a health, the health outcome status. And you suggested that that was a the problem there is therefore having to model that and make estimates. Um, and, and that's where some of the credibility gap begins to fall. And I'm just wondering whether there are alternative ways, which maybe reflects the discussion earlier, about trying to establish what the value is of quality improvement uh, in terms of what what would people be willing to invest to achieve certain levels of quality and in what quality domains I was you know uh, for instance the UK probably invests dramatic still a lot in the confidential inquiry mechanism it's actually only now a few couple of dozen cases <laughs> um, but it's still extremely high profile um, and so is uh, it forces a, a big quality debate. Similarly, the waiting times in accident and emergency for reasons I can't fathom, uh, whether they have anything to do with health, they are a massive political value. Um, so are there other ways of, leave, of establishing value to the right audiences so that we can leverage that um, rather than just f focusing on the more narrow cost effectiveness? Um, and, and that requires maybe a range of different economic uh, techniques or um, and just maybe one quick thing on the DHS um, so the DHS has obviously been extremely valuable but it it, it, it isn't particularly fine-grained and it does seem to me that in 2015 uh, that if we're going to continue to need to rely on five yearly sample surveys for our data on health outcomes that seems a bit of a tragedy um, you know only one country in Africa has got more than 50% vital registration um, in terms of more, you know, knowing deaths. We, ne we need to be moving the information agenda beyond DHS. Okay, any comments on the question that was posed? So thinking about the, uh, the process indicator versus the outcome indicator and using epidemiological data to go from one to the other, in some of the studies that we do, we do not do that epidemiological um, modeling because the data just aren't there. So what we have to do is report, okay, this intervention cost X dollars per additional uh, mother treated to compliance with active management at third stage labor. That's probably not a good example because we can actually get reasonably good data from that generally. Let's say with ART uh, per additional patient who's not lost a follow-up. Um, so in those cases, I mean, sometimes we, we can't say what health outcomes are going to be down the track for that, and we, we don't have the epidemiology to, to project. But we can say, okay, well, it only costs a dollar to keep a person on treatment. Is, is it worth it? And this is where, you know, the funder's judgment comes in. And in some cases, we can say, okay, well, it actually saved money to get that person still in coverage, in which case it doesn't really matter about what those outcomes were, because we know that it's good to keep a person on ART still in treatment. We know that for sure. Um, so, you know, we have to take a, a variety of approaches, but there's not one really good answer to that question. And the, one of the issues that I have is that in the improvement field in general, we don't really talk about it much. You know, this is the most I've discussed these issues in years of doing this stuff. And I go to international conferences and try to talk about it, but generally they, they just don't talk about it much. But good questions. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank the panel for uh, presenting today, and uh, so we'll give them a round of applause and say thank you.